Dragon's Dogma 2 is just around the corner and today I will be going over all the new features and the biggest changes that have recently been revealed. There's a lot of new information that has been revealed through interviews and many key details that may have gone unnoticed, so I hope you enjoyed this extensive coverage. With that being said, hello everyone, my name is Dark Hero and let's get started. So, by far one of the biggest details that we got for Dragon's Dogma 2 from some of these interviews was the confirmation that there would only be 10 vocations at launch. This caught quite a few people by surprise as the original Dragon's Dogma followed a color pattern for its vocations, with the starting and advancing vocations having the same color, but then there were the hybrid vocations. These hybrid vocations could only be selected by the Arisen and were a mix of these colors. So for example the Assassin was a hybrid of the Fighter and the Strider. Given the precedent that Dragon's Dogma once set, many players were expecting the sequel to follow suit and offer an advanced vocation for the Thief or the Archer, or a hybrid vocation that would include the Thief. But as it turns out, that will not be the case, at least at launch. This is particularly interesting because for one, Ranger already existed as the advanced vocation of Strider in the previous game. I imagine the reason why we don't have Ranger in Dragon's Dogma 2 is likely due to Strider being split off into Thief and Archer. So the melee oriented skills and properties of the Strider would go on to become more prominent in the Thief, whereas the long distance bow playstyle of Ranger would become the Archer. But yet another peculiar choice is that of the Trickster which has a purple and pink color combination which left many to speculate that it could potentially be a mix of the advanced vocation Sorcerer and Warrior, however this color choice seems to ultimately be arbitrary. And then of course there is the case of the Warfarer, a unique vocation that seems to be going for a jack of all trades playstyle, letting the Arisen not only use every weapon in the game but also learn skills from every vocation. And thus, Warfarer ends up having a great background, devoid of personality, which I find fitting. It's a shame that many fan favorite vocations won't make it into launch, though there is a chance that they will be later added on as DLC, especially considering that Dragon's Dogma 2 is already looking to do very well in the sales department. At any rate, it seems Mystic Knight fans might be left behind as it has been replaced with the Mystic Spearhand, although aspects of this vocation seem to be present in Dragon's Dogma 2's fighter. Now the next point is regarding the game's combat, specifically your active skills in Dragon's Dogma 2. In the first game you were able to equip 3 different skills that you would be able to trigger by pressing the R1 or the right bumper and then using one of 3 face buttons, so for example you would press R1 and square to perform a skull splitter. In addition, all the vocations with the exception of the warrior were able to gain access to 3 more skills by pressing the L1 or the left bumper. However, that all changes in Dragon's Dogma 2. In the sequel, if you hold the left bumper or the L1 button, you are still able to then press one of the face buttons to perform one of three skills that you equip. That being said, pressing the R1 button or the right bumper will have your character performing a vocation specific action. These are essentially vocation specific mechanics. In the case of the fighter it's quite simply a block or a parry, whereas with the magic archer you would be able to perform the skill spin point volley as well as rivet shot. And as for the mystic spearhand you gain access to the redoubted bolt. I believe that this is going to add a lot more depth to each different vocation, especially given that no vocation can use different weapons apart from of course the Warfarer, so having this extra mechanical depth is going to make the gameplay a lot more enjoyable. That being said, while we are still on the topic of combat, another very cool feature that is being added in Dragon's Dogma 2 is an execution-like mechanic that many reviewers were calling critical attacks. Basically, you would be able to go up to a monster that is downed or pinned, and by pressing the triangle button you would be able to perform this execution attack that would have a different animation and would only outright kill the opponent as long as it deals enough damage to kill them. Don't think of it as a God of War mechanic where you see the circle button pop up and you go up to the monster, press it and they instantly die. Here it's a lot more seamlessly implemented into the gameplay, you don't even see a prompt appear for you to press the button to perform the execution, you just topple a griffin and naturally go up to it and perform the critical attack. Additionally, when grappling onto enemies, Dragon's Dogma 2 will allow you to pull your weight down on the opponent so that you can more easily make them fall to make them vulnerable. This really feels like the perfect evolution of combat from Dragon's Dogma 1 and I thought that this mechanic would be a little bit clunky but having seen it in action, it does feel very natural and tied to the gameplay, so ultimately you will be left with more options on how to tackle each different challenge. 
A change that I'm also glad to see is that now you will have a shortcut for your consumable items. Before, if you were in the middle of combat and got injured for whatever reason, let's say that you got inflated with the blindness ailment and you want to quickly restore your HP and take care of the blindness. In Dragon's Dogma 1, you would have to pause the game, go into your consumables and pick whichever ones you want to use, which would effectively kill the entire momentum of the fight, and so the entire difficulty of the game goes to the wayside, and it becomes, do you have enough consumables to be able to last the fight, assuming you don't get one shot? Well, thankfully, in Dragon's Dogma 2, by simply pressing the left bumper or the L1 button, you will be able to bring up a shortcut for your consumables, and then you're able to press any direction on the D-pad to be able to select which one you want to use. Now we currently don't know exactly if you can choose whichever items go into which shortcut from all of the preview and early access footage that is out there and from what I have discussed with a few creators that had the chance to play it, all of them seem to have the exact same shortcut setup so if you were to press L1 plus up on the D-pad, you would bring up a healing item, and if you were to press L1 plus down on the D-pad, you would bring up a stamina recovery item, with the right button on the D-pad being saved for the lantern and the left button being saved for bringing up the entire item menu. Hopefully when the game releases we are able to change these shortcuts, because I imagine that some vocations, especially the archers, will want to change them to be able to add different arrows and such. Regardless, even if they don't give you that option, I do believe that it is a fantastic feature, as I never liked having to pause to heal myself, be it in Dragon's Dogma, Skyrim or Tears of the Kingdom. One key concern that a lot of players are having about Dragon's Dogma 2 is the game's framerate, as all of the gameplay previews were captured on the PS5 and they were all running at 30fps with some minor dips. Thankfully, the director has confirmed that Dragon's Dogma 2 will be releasing with an uncapped framerate, but given that the game is not going to be releasing with a performance mode on PS5, it's safe to assume that you won't be able to play it at 60fps. However, on the other hand, now that we have access to the character creator demo, in the Steam version you can go into the settings and see that there is a 60fps option along with the option for 120fps as well as variable fps. So at the very least you'll be able to play on higher frame rates on PC. I'm someone that always prefers to have better frame rate over resolution so I will be playing the game primarily on Steam, but I will also be checking out the PS5 version to give you guys an assessment on how good it is. Now the next one is a massive change that is going to be the most impactful to players that like to experiment with different vocations. As in Dragon's Dogma 2, character stats will adjust to the vocation you swap into, taking into account all the stat growths you would have received with that vocation as if you had it from the very start. In the previous game that was not the case, so if you wanted to play a magic archer for example and wanted to optimize your stats, you would have to start off as a mage rather than any other vocation you may want to play instead. So now the game will automatically adjust accordingly, so you can start off in a completely different direction than the one you end up going with, and it will have no bearing in the final stats of your character. This is fantastic news, not only because of the feature itself, but also because it proves that the developer team have heard and addressed a common bit of feedback from the first game. Which is why it baffles me that they have made the following change. You see, in Dragon's Dogma 2 you will have less equipment slots for your characters. The armor and clothing slots have been merged into one, effectively reducing the number of equipment slots by two. The director of Dragon's Dogma 2, Itsuno, has stated the reason for this change being, quote, We changed the armor system and simplified it with the goal that people choose different things to have more visual variety. We wanted to balance it in a way so that people wouldn't end up always choosing the same things. In that regard, we added more variety and simplified the system. Rather than having an inner and outer, we divided the equipment for the upper half of the body and the lower half of the body. We added helms and capes. There are some presets, but overall, well, something that happened in the previous game at high levels was that people would go for the same kind of equipment in the end. This time we made a conscious goal of trying to create something that even at higher levels people would be encouraged to choose different things. So ultimately you will still have cloaks, helmets and rings, as well as the upper body part and the lower body part. But personally I don't buy the justification given for this. The comment about people going with the same armor in the endgame of Dragon's Dogma 1 is quite fair in my opinion, however it feels like a cop-out answer because the real reason why people were using the same armor sets in the endgame of the first game was because there wasn't a lot of variety when it came to powerful endgame sets. 
It's as simple as that, if the developers had added more armors, people would be more willing to try different things. It is on the developers to create powerful and meaningful gear that people would want to chase after. And so while I appreciate the fact that the development team will try to broaden the amount of armor sets in the endgame, it's just a shame that it comes at the cost of a couple of equipment slots, especially with how different you could make your character look in the first game. Also on the topic of vocations, as many of you already know, the hybrid vocations are exclusive to the Arisen, meaning that the pawns can only use the starter and the advanced vocations, so that would be the fighter, mage, thief, archer, sorcerer and warrior, with the mystic spearhand, the magic archer, the trickster and the warfarer being limited to the player character. However, a very important detail that was also said in a different interview was that apparently there are going to be pawn exclusive vocations. This was taken from a Korean interview, but everything that I have read about it does seem to indicate that the translations are correct and that indeed the pawns will be able to have their own exclusive vocations. I would still take this information with a grain of salt, as it really doesn't seem likely for this to be the case in the actual game, but I do believe that it is something that I should mention in this video. The next detail that was recently revealed about Dragon's Dogma 2 is regarding the game's revive mechanic. You see in the first game whenever one of your pawns go down, in order to revive them the Arisen must go up to them and aid them by simply tapping them and they will be restored back to life with half of their health. If you don't do so after a certain amount of time, their corpse will disappear and will go back to the rift. That being said, in Dragon's Dogma 2 it looks like you'll need to spend a little bit more time to revive your pawns, you won't be able to simply tap them on the shoulder, you actually have to hold down the button for a certain amount of time to pick them back up. So there is a little bit of a risk associated with getting back one of your pawns. But then of course you can always pick them up, carry them on your back or throw them behind a rock to be able to revive them safely. Additionally, through all of these gameplay previews, we've been able to see a bunch of spells in action that allow you to instantly revive your pawns. One very cool skill in particular was the medic shot from the magic archer, which as you can see from this clip by Rurikan, he is aiming at an unconscious pawn to revive them. But because there is a second pawn nearby that is not at full health, the skill medic shot is going to target both and so the first pawn will be revived and the second one will be healed. It looks like a lot more vocations in this game are going to have some support oriented abilities. We saw something similar with the Mystic Spearhand also having a healing spell, so it's cool that we're going to have more options than just the basic mage to provide some support for your party. Now somewhat also on the topic of revives, the director has also said that any NPC you kill in Dragon's Dogma 2 will die permanently, with the only way you have of being able to revive them being to use the Wake Stones, which in the first game were very rare in the beginning. They become a lot more common especially towards the latter half of the game, but a very cool detail about Dragon's Dogma 2 is that since there is no loading screen between entering and leaving towns, monsters will actually be able to enter and invade towns and cities. And we actually get to see a glimpse of this in the latest trailer, where a griffin enters the city through the gate. And of course, if an NPC that you like ends up dying because of this, you may have to spend one of your valuable wake stones to be able to revive them. Ultimately, I don't think that this is going to matter too much, as the key NPCs that are important for the game's storyline are likely not going to die. But even so, I do believe that this is a feature that just adds a lot more flavor into the game, and also from what we saw in the latest trailer, you'll be able to build rapport with pretty much any random NPC you find, you're able to pay around at the tab, or just like we see in the trailer, the Arisen straight up picks one of the girls up as he is flirting with her. I have no idea how romance is going to work in Dragon's Dogma 2, in the first game it was a very basic system, where the character that you build the most affinity with by simply doing quests with that NPC or giving them items, is the one that you end up having a romantic scene with at the end of the game. But what ended up happening for a lot of players, myself included, was that one of the major vendors in the game actually ended up becoming your main romance because that was where you spent the most money in the game. Hopefully that system is a little bit more robust this time around, but regardless having the extra flavor of your favorite NPCs dying makes the game a lot more interesting in my opinion. And of course, the biggest detail about all of these interviews and gameplay previews was that the food that you cook at the campsites is quite simply real meat that was recorded by the developers and made to look as good as possible. But seriously though, 
Everything that we have seen about the game is absolutely phenomenal, with the only thing that I'm not too keen on being the fact that we have two less equipment slots. But even so, I am incredibly hyped for this game. I have already spent a ton of time in the character creator making my masterpieces, as I'm sure most of you have done as well, so I may make a video where I go over some of them. With that being said, let me know if there was something that I might have missed, and which vocation will you be playing in Dragon's Dogma 2? Having said that, thank you all so much for watching, my name is Dark Hero, and as always, happy hunting!